holiday travel, there is some increased risk of uh, being exposed to people with COVID and actually getting COVID yourself. The issues relate to the number of people you're interacting with and how close you're uh, interacting with them. You know, if you're staying at home, you're going to be exposed to many fewer people than if you're out and about in a busy bus terminal, in an airport, in, in other places where people congregate and, and many people come from many different areas. Um, that, that leads to higher risk overall. So there is risk, there's ways to improve your risk uh, profile. And you have to think about that balance between your individual risk and um, the lost opportunities of not traveling and seeing family. When you're in an airport, you're interacting with many potential people. So trying to stay um, at least six feet apart, how we talk about it is uh, they spread out their arms, you spread out your arms, and you can't touch each other. That's about six feet. To the extent that you can uh, stay uh, distanced from other people, that's great. And while you're in an airport, certainly wear a mask, a cloth mask. And if you have one, an N95 or other respirator is also uh, recommended, uh, both to protect yourself, but also to protect others. And uh, airports are pretty good about making sure that everyone is wearing masks and that they have good procedures in place for social distancing for making sure that there's space between you uh, and the next person in the TSA line, all of those things. So I, I've seen that airports are actually very well organized in terms of the kinds of things you need to minimize risk of getting COVID. On airplanes, the airflow is a, a protective factor compared to some other types of transportation. There are a lot of air exchanges and generally in most airplanes, the fresh air comes in from near your feet and goes out directly above you. So it's not, necessarily circulating all around the airplane and they do have HEPA filters built in as well. Check with your airline. Different airlines have different policies in terms of leaving the middle seat empty versus filling every seat. Um, and also think about things like how many transfers are you going to have? You want to minimize the number of times you move from one plane to another airport to another plane if you can um, with uh, direct travel. Now we've looked at, there are studies that show that there are spread events on airplanes as well, but those studies also found that it was in highly concentrated settings where people were not wearing masks, where people were actively coughing. And even then, there were very few people um, who were ultimately tested positive uh, and, and confirmed sick. So compared to some of the super spreader events that we've seen, airplanes seem to have a relative uh, relatively less of a chance of being super spreader events, especially if airlines enforce masking, which they seem to be doing, if they enforce trying to keep people healthy uh, and, and not sick before they board the plane. And more and more, uh, depending on where you're visiting, there are quarantine policies in place. So airlines are now having things like offering um, a specific passport where if you are tested and you test negative three days up to 72 hours before you travel, then when you arrive in your destination state, you don't have to quarantine for two weeks. That's leading to a relatively healthier population depending on the destination and the nature of the travel. Uh, some of the places are relatively safer to go to than others. Yeah, so let me start by saying, first of all, any mask is better than no mask. Um, the, the stopping of the aerosolized particles is what we're looking to do. If you're coughing, if you're um, um, breathing heavily after a workout, those kinds of um, particles tend to be laden with more COVID virus if, you, if you're infected than not. So first, any mask is better than none. And then certainly the higher the grade the mask, the better the protection, both for yourself and for others. So at this point, most folks are recommending widespread use of the cloth masks because they're widely available. You can get different kinds of cloth masks that fit over your nose and your mouth that some allow the insertion of paper filters, for example, uh, which again is, is better. So to the extent that you have to balance your comfort, your ability to wear a mask for an extended period of time. Uh, I also mentioned that when you're traveling, you wanna bring a few masks along because what happens if you happen to sneeze in one mask? You don't want to keep wearing that mask. You want to have a backup or a backup to the backup as well.
Yeah, I think I would start by uh, notifying the flight attendant because I think they've been trained in this now and they see this uh, several times a day uh, as opposed to um, trying something on my own initially and seeing how the flight attendant deals with this. So there's very little evidence on this. And so it would be speculative for me to say that there's an X percent chance of transmission through the eyes. Certainly all surfaces, we know that surfaces are much less transmission of COVID than we initially thought. And it doesn't mean that you're hundred percent safe, but if you have someone cough on a surface and then you touch it immediately and you rub your eyes, there's a chance that you could get COVID that way. The other part about COVID is it's about how much you're exposed to that it seems to be determining how sick you get for many people. So if you're exposed to uh, a smaller viral load relative to a very high viral load, uh, you're, you're in the latter state, you're much more likely to get sick, uh, number one, and have a, a more serious course. And so to the extent that surface transmission, transmission through the eyes and all seems to have relatively less uh, viral load associated with it, um, I'm not saying you're safe, but you should be more worried about that droplet transmission. You should be worried about confined spaces where people are breathing or, or are singing loudly amongst each other. Those kinds of activities seem to lead to uh, the super spreader events that we've talked about. We, we do know that there are different ventilation systems in, in buses and trains relative to airplanes, which are high efficiency or HEPA filters uh, with optimized airflow with numerous exchanges over time. And uh, when you're traveling in a confined compartment like a bus or a train, I'm not sure that they're always up to the same standards, depending on how old the train is, how packed it is, all of that. So there's less certainty about the safety um, on the wide variety of other transportation modalities relative to airplanes where there's a, a relatively higher standard and more uniformity in terms of how uh, the air exchanges occur. It's the simple protection. Think about it when you're going to fill up the gas, are you going to potentially either uh, wipe down the nozzle before you use the gas pump, or are you going to hand sanitize immediately after? Those are simple things you can do. If you're entering a hotel, do you take some of the surfaces that are um, most exposed or where you may be touching a lot, for example, the TV remote, and, and wipe them down versus do you leave them alone? Um, ob obviously wash your hands with soap and water uh, as frequently as possible when you're out and about and don't forget your own uh, moisturizer. If you're washing your hands enough, your hands should be dry and chapped as you're traveling. But then think about packing your own food. Think about ways to um, minimize stops so that everyone gets off at one time instead of making three stops along the way. Those are simple things you can do to just minimize the number of potential contacts with other people in crowded spaces. If you're going from point A to point B and you're going with known people who you've been cohorting with anyway, certainly being with family, you know, it, you know it's a choice. Do I take the five hour drive to LA or do I get on a you know, one hour flight? And for each individual doing any holiday travel, I, I suggest a framework where you look at three things. One is your individual risk. Do you have chronic conditions, your age, other things we know are associated with higher risk of having problems from COVID. Then you look at the transportation factors. You mentioned the airplane versus a car and the convenience factors, things like that. Then we uh, should look at where you're going. So are you going to a place which could be potentially a super spreader event like a large wedding? Or are you going to spend time with uh, a few family members in an isolated location? So if you think about both individual factors, the travel factors and your destination factors, I think that's a good way to try to quantify the risk. All of these are small percentages and you have to balance. We can't give you a good number at the end of the day, but to the extent that you can minimize risk for each and every step of the way, it's safer rather than higher risk. With the holidays, there is going to be a lot of concentrated travel on the weekend before and the weekend after. But with the nature of remote work, with the nature of remote schools, there is some flexibility you might have. So if you think out of the box and say, let's all delay Thanksgiving one week family, uh, 
and figure it out. Um, you might find it cheaper to get an Airbnb. You might find it easier to travel. You might find your uh, airfare rates to be significantly lower. And more importantly, uh, the risk of congregating in closed spaces with many people along the way will also decrease. So if you have the luxury of having a chance to move your travel dates a little forward or backwards off of the peak times, or considering other alternatives like meeting somewhere um, more remote or without um, too many other pods uh, uh, around you, that might make it a little safer. And so it's all about balancing your risk and reward To the extent that uh, I would consider the risk is the risk rising, is the risk uh, lowering on where you're going. If you'll notice, for example, in uh, mid-November, uh, rates are rising in the Midwest and in other parts on the coasts, they're actually decreasing relative to the past wave. So if you're traveling, you don't necessarily want to go to an emerging hotspot unless you have no choice. You want to go to places that have uh, seen COVID already sweep over them in which places they understand the importance of social distancing, where there's broad use of masks, where there's um, other uh, things that businesses have done, public health officials have done in terms of limiting uh, indoor dining and other things to limit risk. Those are the places which are relatively safer to travel to than places with um, rapidly rising cases. Now, certainly in winter time, um, when it's cold, it's hard to be outside. And, and so warmer areas are, are probably more preferred destinations where you can have family gatherings outside uh, as opposed to uh, in a tightly packed indoor space in an old home, which doesn't have as many air exchanges perhaps as uh, some of the newer homes, for example. So there's a lot of considerations. The duration of travel is certainly one of them, but I think it's more related to the type of travel, the types of uh, concentrations of individuals you're exposed to more than just the pure duration of travel. So first of all, limit your indoor gatherings to people, uh, if you can, to 10 or fewer people. That's one thing we know. Second is make sure that everyone washes their hands uh, often. Uh, if anyone is sick or has been exposed please have them self-isolate and not join the gathering. I mean, that's very hard to do, but that's how transmission happens. And then certainly to the extent that you can, when you're actually meeting indoors, try to stay apart, you know, wear the masks as you're talking to one another. Uh, while you're eating, try to be apart so that uh, when you're not wearing the mask, air, air, airborne transmission doesn't happen. Those are things that are hard to do when you're coming together with family and friends for social purposes, how can you be so antisocial? But depending on the risk, it could mean the difference between life or death for a loved one who's older, has more chronic conditions, and has until now been safe. You know, the COVID Act Now site has uh, got a lot of very useful information for families thinking about travel. Because what those metrics uh, tell you is, for example, how, how much load are the hospitals seeing? Uh, that, that may be important to someone who um, uh, may be thinking about higher risk activities and uh, wanna know that they'll be taken care of, right? Or they're traveling with uh, older individuals who um, may not have such an easy course and may require uh, higher levels of care should they get sick. So to the extent that each one of those metrics will tell you different parts of your overall risk profile, uh, spend some time on it, learn what the metrics uh, mean, watch a few videos uh, beyond there to understand how that relates to your individual risk and make an informed decision. The holidays are an important time to get together with family and friends. We know that flu season always occurs during the holidays and in the winter months because people are congregated in tight spaces together, there's less uh, chances to meet outdoors. And as a result, flu goes up. We expect the same to happen with COVID as people are concentrated in more compact areas. To the extent that you can minimize your risks and minimize the risks to those who you love and who you, your friends and family, do what it takes, including getting your flu shot, wearing a mask, and staying socially isolated and distance as much as you can minimizing your risk and thereby minimizing the risk of those around you.